Paris Capital, Silicon Valley Bank and Beachpoint Capital. Uh, before that, we're going to hear a war story uh, from a great teller of war stories, uh, Ronan uh, Horgan of Capital Flow, who I know through Punch of Town and other things, but uh, uh, he's, he's, he's a banker turned good, uh, basically, uh, which is not always the case. Um, and we're going to have a fantastic, a fantastic uh, story of Ultratech uh, from a person whose day job is a professor in Limerick University, uh, who's now on our third uh, business, and it's a cracking uh, molecular detection uh, uh, biotech company. Uh, but first, uh, what we have for you is a panel discussion, uh, and I suppose that the commonality of the four panelists on my right uh, is that they have been founders of companies. They have been through different uh, iterations and phases of raising capital and of growing their business from startup uh, right through. So the, the theme of this is raising funding to achieve your growth, founders considerations. So we're kind of pole vaulting back from the kind of end stage of IPO, which you heard with Niall Jones, uh, to, to, to a, a, an earlier uh, stage. And of course, one of the things that we heard from the outset was that what the VC people, what the bank manager is really looking at is the individual. Uh, how, how good are they are listening, how adaptable are they, what is their ambition, uh, and, uh, you know, can they sell a good story as well as produce a good service or product. So it's a great uh, pleasure uh, to welcome, uh, uh, in, in, in no particular order, uh, John Ryan of uh, Gigabill. Uh, and, and I'm going to allow them to explain their own story, because if they're any decent, anyway, half decent, they should be better at selling it than me. But essentially, it is a platform, uh, a recruitment platform, for people to get uh, all types of jobs in the hospitality sector, even stewarding in a place like here or the Aviva, and so on. That's John Ryan of Gigabill, uh, based in Dublin, operating in the UK and Irish market. Uh, Conor McGinn is co-founder and CEO of Acara Robotics, uh, and, and, and basically all of these are award-winning, uh, they're really good, uh, best-in-class success stories. Uh, then we have a physiotherapist made good, co-founder and CEO of Wellola, uh, Sonia Neary, and we have Riona Negralish, I hope I pronounced that right, of Provera. Now, a lot of these are spin-outs from uh, universities. We've heard about the four universities earlier. So, without further ado, I'm going to start with you, John, just to explain who you are and what you do and what stage you're at. John. Perfect. Thanks, Ivan, and uh, thanks, everybody, for being here, and it's a pleasure to speak to you all today. Um, so, as Ivan just said, my name is John Ryan. I'm the founder and CEO of Gigable.com, and we kind of don't call ourselves HR normally, but I suppose HR would be a, kind of a, a more traditional term for what we do. We solve the problem for businesses of getting them short-term contract staff, essentially. Uh, primarily, that's delivery drivers, but we also do stewarding, security staff, hospitality staff as well. So as we're all familiar with, there's a worker scarcity problem at the moment, and flexible work is incredibly important to both you know, individuals and businesses. So we have created a transparent marketplace to put the two together. So let's, let's, when did you set up? Where are you based? Give me some numbers. Yeah, so we set up in 2018. Uh, we've raised about three million, uh, a little bit over three million in capital since that time. Fantastic uh, angel investors, uh, brilliant support from Delta Partners VC and Enterprise Ireland. So we've had a good funding story. Uh, we've had about 6,000 contract workers work through the platform this year, 600 businesses across the UK and Ireland. Uh, we've just assembled a revenue team in London and we're looking to 3X where we are today in the London market before the end of Q1 next year. So very exciting time for us. Uh, and and what does, what's Gigabell's does USP that nobody else in the world does? I think, you know, to use a fancy term, we're a decentralized marketplace. And what that essentially means is that we give a full identity and a, you know, a level position in the work market to the actual worker, the contractor. Often contractors and workers are pulled into centralized systems, are told where to go and what to do and what time of the day and what day of the week. That doesn't suit the modern worker, as you employers here will probably be very familiar with, especially not in the gig economy sector where there's been a, a severe lack of transparency and a lot of centralized control. So we're trying to break up that industry, the gig economy, give a transparent identity and a, a, a meaningful 
uh, means of earning an income to the workers, but also on the business side, getting them to level up, tell the marketplace what they're paying their workers, you know, committing to paying a certain amount per hour to gig economy workers, which has been a problem in the space previously, and also just have a, a kind of a, a level playing field in that space, which is totally unique. Okay, Conor McGinn, you're TCD's first uh, robotics professor, I think. I believe so. And, and, and you've been involved in the innovation lab and you've spun out of that. So tell us about Acara Robotics. Thanks, Ivan. Um, so we spun out Acara Robotics back in 2019, just before the pandemic. And at the time, um, our idea was to automate elements of work in nursing homes. But of course, once the pandemic hit, um, nursing homes closed the doors to innovation like ours. But we saw another opportunity in hospitals, and in particular, we saw an opportunity in environmental services and how things like cleaning were getting done. Um, cleaning in hospitals is subject to, to huge degrees of human error, and the time it takes to clean actually often leads to a significant amount of downtime where procedures can't get done. And we saw that you know, hospital capacity in country like, countries like Ireland has reduced by a factor of four since 1980 because <coughs> our population has grown so much, and you know, if it costs us a billion to build a hospital, then you know, we just simply can't keep up. So what we've been able to do is build automation that works closely with cleaners in hospitals, allowing them to clean not only better, but significantly faster, up to six times faster, and using a fraction of the resources that it currently takes. So it's not a bucket and a mop and some <laughs> jade fluid. It's, it's, it's AV light, UV lighting. Yeah, there's a combination of different technologies we use. So like when you think of cleaning a hospital, you'll think of a person going in with a bucket and a mop, but that's really just getting surfaces. It's not getting the air, which constitutes the majority of the room, as we know. So we have robots that can be tuned to either focus on surfaces, whereby we use germ-killing light, but we also are able to do air as well. So if those robots use HEPA filtering and a few other things too. Um, but when you think of killing germs, you can't see these things. So what we were able to do is go in and actually um, do environmental sampling of these areas. So we can actually understand where in the room the germs tend to reside. And using artificial intelligence and other methods, we can build very repeatable ways to clean. So again, we can actually have very targeted programs that allow hospitals to get considerably better performance than what they're currently getting using a fraction of the resources that it currently takes. So talk to me about money. <laughs> <laughs> sales, revenue, jobs, all that kind of stuff. Sure. Well, we're at the stage now where the robots are just coming out to market. So our, our goal initially was to establish flagship hospitals where we could prove the technology works because, you know, people have, have heard people give the same pitch as me before but not actually see the results. Um, so uh, just to, to give a summary of our most recent trial, we, we put out a press release about two weeks ago uh, which took place in the, the southwest of England um, and they installed our robot in the space of two months uh, they were able to do under 800 procedures than what they would have normally done uh, under the current circumstances. So if you project that forward, um, that would be kind of an additional million uh, minimum a year in additional revenue. That the so are, are you at the pre-revenue stage? Well, we are bringing in some funding, but generally speaking, um, like the CE marking is, is just at the point of completion at the moment. So when we work with a hospital, usually we ask for some contribution to cover costs, but we're not at the point yet where it's a product. So when will you be selling robots? From next year. Q1 okay. to Q2 of next year, we expect to start uh, officially. Okay, okay. Right. Uh, Sonia Neary, well, Ola. So you started off being a, a physiotherapist, and you now claim that well, Ola is an innovative digital health software company that allows people to plan their care. Is that right? Explain. Thanks, Ivan, and good morning. Um, my name is Sonia Neary. Yes, I am a physiotherapist by trade, and I'm the CEO and one of the co-founders at Willola. Um, at Willola, we believe that you should only be cared for in a hospital setting if you're acutely unwell. And to that end, we've built highly modularized patient communication technology. It plugs into the system in a hospital setting or in a primary care setting. And broadly speaking, it has eight modules. Half of them are administrative, so it allows you to do things like see aspects of your medical record, manage your appointments, fill in forms online, and so on. And then the other half is broadly clinical, so you can remotely track your symptoms, connect to your medical devices, connect your wearables, and so on. Um, so buyers of our, our, our system are largely NHS, uh, private sector in the UK, some buyers in Ireland. Uh, we've signed a contract with Leeds Teaching Hospital Trust, which is one of the largest trusts outside the Greater London region, Birmingham Community Trust. Our technology is sitting in over 170 care centres in Ireland, residential care facilities, and we would have worked with the likes of the HSC at height of COVID uh, to deploy our solution to the GPs in Ireland as well. So we're sort of agnostic to the sector that utilises our system, but ultimately our goal is preventative community-based care delivery. But typically they will be suffering from what conditions? Any condition 
Um, you know, so in terms of the you know, Leeds Teaching Hospital Trust, it has eight major hospitals, all of them sort of centers of excellence in oncology, cardiology, orthopedics. Um, so any patient that is a service user of Leeds Teaching Hospital Trust, to take that example, regardless of their condition, can opt in to use the portal and connect to the care record and receive remote care as So as is required. it data analytics or, or no? No, it's, it's the sharing of healthcare information. So at the moment, you know, in the analog world, you know, Taking my example as when I worked as a physiotherapist, you know, a patient of mine would have discharged from the hospital. They would have gone home. Their knee might have gotten infected. They're having an experience at home. They stop taking their antibiotics. They deteriorate, what have you. In the hospital, I would have all of their care records, their blood results, their x-rays, their op notes, all of this really rich data over here within the boundaries of the hospital wall. And the problem with that is that it's really disconnected. Neither party has the full picture. And, and when you do have the full picture connected digitally, for example, the outcome are better, the patient is more empowered. So is it and removing paper? It's removing paper, but it's also bringing care closer to the home. It's bringing the patient into the centre of that care and, and allowing them to inform that through sending data inbound, receiving educational resources, getting onto virtual <coughs> care pathways. Um, yeah, okay. so it's modernising so that, that care pathway, really. Looking forward for 2023, what are your KPIs? So uh, we're intending to secure in the region of about 25 more uh, customers over the course of next year. We've already tripled our revenue from last year. Uh, our team are at 17, again, looking to increase that to up to about 25 people as well. Um, and revenues this year are short of a million. We're looking to triple that for next year too. Uh, we set up a, an office in the Leeds Nexus um, and we're sort of looking primarily to focus our expansion in the UK market. Okay. Rena in the Relish, uh, Pro Virum. <laughs> Very exciting. You, you've raised 30 million, Series A. Uh, you deal with a specific, is, is it as simple as prostate problems? Um, explain who your patients are and how far you've got down the track. Yes, thank you, Ivan. So, um Prostate problems is, is one way to call it. So we have developed a solution for benign prostatic hyperplasia, which uh, is also known as BPH. It's a condition that would affect most men kind of over the age of 60 at, into, into their 70s, where the prostate gland enlarges around the urethra, which is the tube that uh, allows urinary flow out of the body. Um, so this is a very common condition. And at the moment, the current treatment options for that are a, a very invasive surgery or drug therapies. So both of those um, options have side effects and also some un, kind of unwanted um, uh, associative uh, conditions that, that men just don't want. So what we have developed is a minimally invasive option to treat these symptoms. So it's an implantable medical device that can go in in a very minimally invasive way in a very quick, uh, easy procedure for a clinician um, and allows the uh, kind of return of normal urinary flow patterns through pushing out the, the tissue that's obstructing. Um, so where we are in that journey is, as you said, Ivan, we've, we've raised um, up to uh, 40 million to date, 30 of which was raised in a Series A last year, uh, where we closed that uh, round to allow us to um, run a clinical study in the US across 15 sites, so 225 patients, to show efficacy of this solution um, and hope to get regulatory approval of that technology to bring it commercial. So the manufacture of the implants is where you're at? We've manufactured the implants, we are continuing to do that, but we're also in patients. So we have started that study, we're about 30 patients in, and um, that, that's uh, go going to essentially show efficacy of our technology and our solution against other technologies that have been used in this space. And, and in five years' time, what does the world look like? How many men will have these implants? What, what, what's your possibility? Yeah, I mean, it, 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 it's, all, it's, it's very possible that our solution, if we get that regulatory approval, will be an option for patients in instead of uh, electing to have a drug as the first option therapy, uh, and also um, to have it instead of having a major surgery. So uh, we would see this as something that many patients would elect to have instead so of the options. So what is your TAM, your total addressable market? Um, so va valuations that we've had for this previously would be previous technologies that were uh, acquired in the space um, a couple of years ago. Now they were at a commercial stage, but uh, the, you know other technologies have been, uh, had a price of say 1.1 billion for those uh, technologies that were acquired with commercial revenues. Um, it's a huge market. It's 50% it's of the population uh, who have PPH. Okay. So now what we want to do is, and please do, uh, I gave the Slido, to, oh, there it is. Uh, uh, please do, Slido, hashtag uh, Raising Capital 22. And there's a new poll. What types of capital are you most interested in raising? 
state grants, venture capital, debt finance, angel funding, crowdfunding, uh, trade sale, and all of that. And please do get in your questions. Um, okay, okay. Let's let's just flick through some things. And if you've had an experience, state aid, grant aid, could be LEO, could be Enterprise Ireland. Any experiences to share? Good, bad, or indifferent? Put up a hand and just go for it. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so when I started out the company in 2018, um, little more than a, an idea and a piece of paper and a couple of uh, you know PowerPoint decks or whatever a business plan. But I went to Dublin City Leo and told them the story, told them the pitch. They said they'd heard a lot of these ideas before, but this was the most compelling one that they'd heard, and which was which was very nice. And they put their money where their mouth is, gave me five grand as a feasibility grant, which when you have no money to start a business or a little bit of your own capital, means the world. So that was. The Did first you have guy. a day job as well? Uh, at that point, I'd actually gone full in to do Gigable. Okay. Yeah, okay. so I had left. I was previously in the army. I see some former army colleagues in the crowd here. So uh, I'd done an MBA in Smurford, and then I decided to do Gigable shortly after that. So okay. So your experience, Enterprise Ireland. Enterprise Ireland then was the next stage. So I used feasibility grant, built out the value proposition, went into the Enterprise Ireland New Frontiers program. Uh, phase two of that, which is great because it actually pays the founder, uh, so supporting you. Obviously, the founder is the most important part of, of the business, especially in the early stage, because it's, it's your, your time and your sweat that kind of gets it off the ground. So that gives you a lot of training, uh, good guest lectures and good instruction, great introductions. I actually met Delta Partners uh, who invested in Gigable at an, an Enterprise Ireland New Frontiers event. Um, so that was the next stage, and that's 15 grand over six months paid to the founder just to support them. So absolutely crucial in that early stage when you're pre-revenue and you're, as I was, a lone founder trying to build a team and, and build followers and everything else. So absolutely okay. brilliant. Anyone else get any state support? So Cara would have uh, received most of its funding today through different grant programs, beginning at the university. So uh, at the idea stage in the university, it could take years to get technology to the point where it's ready to be commercialized. And, you know, people like SFI and in our case Enterprise Ireland were, were really key to be able to give us that early funding to go from you know, And this, to, this was non-repayable capital? This is non-repayable, but it's to the university on the understanding that if, if something comes of it, a licence then gets made between the startup and the, the university. So it's part of a pathway that exists for, for, for startup companies like ours. But once you kind of you know, commercialise and go into the real world, then it's a different animal. Um, so the, you know, the value of death that I think Peter Jensen mentioned before is, is very real for, for companies like ours because you know we're dealing with a, not only building a new product but also in some cases developing a new market and um, so we've been able to, we've been quite lucky that there is some good opportunities available in Europe to raise money through grants and um, so in, in, at the early days the, we raised I think 200k through small kind of micro grants that uh, effectively allow a company like ours to partner with the hospital to develop develop an, uh, an MVP and um, since then We've worked with uh, the likes of you know, EIT Health, which in our case, they didn't give us funding per se, but they gave us a lot of supports that you know, allowed us to get to a point where we're more investable. And so that's been something we've been really, we've been really grateful for. Uh, and then most recently, we've raised money through the European Investment uh, Council, the IC. So we raised a, a large chunk of funding there. It was over two million. Um, and, and that was just a gift, was it? Well, it's, it's, like, it's a very competitive program. And it, I, just tell me who they are again. The European Innovation Council, effectively, um, would be uh, an umbrella organisation that sits within the European Commission and that tries to identify disruptive technologies that have potential not only for commercial impact but also societal impact. So they look at stuff that potentially is not quite ready yet for VCs, um, but if it was given that you know that 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 support, that it would potentially could reach a point where. And are there any sort of tricky terms and conditions on that? Um, there's some co-investment requirements, which uh, you know it sounds like you know. So they'll give it the money they've given, but on the condition that 30% of the overall grant is co-funded. So even though they're giving you a lot of money, there is some onus for you to raise privately as well. So if you are a company that's considered high risk by investors, you know you haven't fully alleviated the risk. There's still some things you need to do. Uh, but beyond that, no. Um, it's 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 you know you write an application and provided that you execute what you say you're going to do. Um, and of course, there's some flexibility there to adjust things if you need to. Um, but our experience so far has been pretty good. Mm. Sonia, any support? Yep, um, similar to uh, Gigable, we uh, secured funding from the local enterprise office, priming grants, feasibility grants. I exhausted pretty much every available source of uh, free money in the early days. Uh, enterprise Ireland were very kind to us. They gave us competitive start fund and HPSU. Uh, we went down an unusual What's route. What's HPSU? High potential startup funding. Okay. 
they take a percentage of your company for 50,000 euros in the early days for competitive start fund and then they can top that up as long as you co-match the, the funding and we did that through Spark crowdfunding. So we crowdfunded uh, in the region of 150,000 euros and Enterprise Ireland matched that with their high potential startup unit fund. We will be speaking to crowdfunding but I think you're the only one who has done crowdfunding. Yes. What's been, that been like? Yeah, it was fantastic. We were one of the early companies on Spark Crowdfunding's platform. I was talking to Chris earlier who mentioned that about 32 companies have raised there. We are probably maybe the fifth or sixth. Um, it was daunting because you're really going out there with everything and saying, you know, this is us. Do you want to back us? And very kindly, you know, around 50, 52 investors invested in our company at that stage. That was fantastic. Um, we kind of, we'd only asked for 100 and I think 180 came in, but we drew the line at 150. So that was really really good at the time. Um, we also then secured funding from business venture partners, Elliot and his team of a million recently um, in the form of EIIS backed funding. Um, and that's really for us, that's going to really catapult us for the next sort of 18 months. Um, so we're very excited about that as well. State funding? Yeah, so very are. similar to um, Connor's story, we, uh, you know, Proverum came from a research project in Trinity and that was funded by a commercialization fund from Enterprise Ireland. Um, so without that really, I suppose that that's what gave us the start. Um, and then Atlant um, uh, EI uh, helped us as we got um, our private investment kind of secured to, to spin out without uh, kind of getting their follow-on support. You know, I think that would have been a, a, a lot harder. And then moving on from that, um, kind of again speaking to, to, to the valley of death and the, the things that Peter was talking about earlier, as we had kind of exhausted our seed kind of fund and we, we were kind of preparing for our Series A, we were very lucky to get um, further Enterprise Ireland funding and uh, uh, H2020 funding which allowed us to kind of bridge that gap as we went into our Series A round. So we, we have had incredible support from EI and, and that's been a, a huge uh, benefit to us as we grew Proverum. None of you had a problem with red tape or anything like that in getting this free money? Okay, yeah, that's grand. Uh, uh, Silence. So you're not talking about it anyway. Uh, 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 okay, lessons learned, whether it's a private investor, public support, uh, lessons learned, anything you do differently, anything you'd pass on, we'll go along, John. Yeah, um, so obviously loads of lessons learned, loads of little mistakes made along the way, which is true to any founder, I think. But for me, uh, preparing for the talk today, looking back, I think it's really important as a founder to understand your business and the metrics that matter in your business really, really well. And to have a really compelling story as to why those are different to other competitors or why they're going to be, you know, the reason that this business is hugely scalable and could be hugely valuable in the future. I think it takes time sometimes for early stage founders to figure that out. Uh, so the earlier you can do that, the better. So for like a marketplace like us, it's your cost of acquisition, lifetime value of your customers, and what the multiple is between the two is extremely important. And if you can get that out when you're meeting investors up front as to why you know that really, really well, the ins and outs of it, and how you're going to grow to make it, make it uh, extremely impressive uh, across the board in those metrics. Is that self-taught really or did you have an advisor? Because we heard from good buddies earlier how they really have to mentor and tutor people to get, get their message right. That's a great question. I think it's actually just trial and error from meeting so many investors. I've probably met between 50 and 100 different types of investors over the last couple of years, I would say. A lot uh, of tar kickers along the way, I'd say. Uh, well, you know, you can you learn something from everybody, to be honest with you. You know, so you, you kind of have to have an open mind and a learning mentality to all that stuff. But generally, the professional investors will ask you similar questions and they'll want to know the same things. Like, you know, for marketplaces, it's always about the cost of acquisition. How expensive is it for you to acquire a new user? How much can you make from that user over the lifetime of them? So if it's six months or a year that they stay with you, and what's that multiple? So if you can pay back the cost of acquiring a business or, or a contractor in our case in less than a month, that's pretty good. And if you can keep them on the platform for a year and make you know, 12, 13, 14 X that cost of acquisition in that time frame, then happy days, you've got a story to tell. And depending on the stage of the business that you're at as well, if you're pre-seed or seed or you're pre-revenue, it's hard to know that because you don't have any applicable data yet. So you, you need to do your research and say, well, this is what we think from the bit of evidence that we do have or from the market or whatever, and create a compelling story around those metrics. Because at the end of the day, vision is great. You know, the product idea and the things that we could do with the Gigable platform are just immense. It's a huge and amazing product. But ultimately, the metrics are what matter when you're talking to investors, and you can nearly get out in front with those, uh, in my experience. Okay, Connor, lessons learned, do differently? 
I think a lot we would have done differently if we knew now what we, sorry, if we knew then what we know now. But the problem was that during COVID, like things were crazy, especially in hospitals. So with the information we had, I'm not sure we would have done that much differently. Um, that being said, on, on reflection, uh, I think the, the thing that I suppose I've only just realized quite recently is that I think for too long we focused on, on the problem and the technical solution. So we kind of felt that, you know, if we understand the problem well, we understand the ROI and we build a technical solution, you know, people will be queuing up to get it or want it. But when you're bringing technology into a sector that maybe doesn't have it before, um, and there are barriers to entry that maybe you didn't anticipate, then operationalizing that and trying to actually get, engage with the people who are decision makers and motivate them to change what they're doing, um, even you know, towards something that potentially could have a huge upside, that's actually really complicated and really hard. And it varies massively, like in Ireland versus the UK versus the US versus mainland Europe. Um, so I think that's been the key piece that I think I I would have, if I could start anything sooner in terms of effort and work, that, that would be it. Uh, so that just sounds like selling. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. I, 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 think it's, I, think, I think it's more than that because, again, like, you know, for, for, for a lot of products, there's a playbook that exists and you can, you can find someone that's excellent at selling, you know, I don't know, mobile phones yeah. and then you can hire them and then they can, you know, reuse the skills that they used previously for selling mobile phones to sell, you know, in our case, mm. robots. Um, what we're doing is, 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 is more than just trying to sell people, and it, you know, it's, it's not a direct for direct replacement. It's, a, mm. it's, it's getting them to, persuading them to take a leap of faith to change a system that they're currently using towards something that's very different. And that process requires a lot of stakeholders, and especially if you're dealing with you know, entry level workers that are unionized and have all of these other issues in place. You're dealing with infections where you know, the cost for them if something goes wrong is very high. Not only does it mean that potentially infections can get spread, but if our robot in a, in a a hospital stops working and they schedule payments uh, sorry they schedule patients around the number of procedures a day then you're canceling you're canceling procedures so the cost of doing that i don't think we fully factored in in the early stages we just felt that like if we have a good pitch that will be enough to to get the, you know get some of the hospitals over the line and in fact it's taken a lot more work it's taken a lot more kind of co-design with the hospitals involving them at an earlier stage so that they you know feel empowered by it rather than you know okay pressure to come in. Okay, uh, lessons learned. It, it always takes a lot longer than you think? Yeah, um, and certainly as a CEO who didn't have a CFO, I think one of the things that I would do differently is, is you know, try to find that sort of financial advisory earlier on. Um, because for me, you know, the big, you know, push in the early days was build the MVP, validate it. Then the, the real push was revenue and sales and getting customers and valuable customers to evidence uh, the, the benefits of it. So you're trying, you know, fundraising in its own right is a full-time job um, and sort of trying to dip between revenue and re revenue generation and fundraising on crowdfunding platforms and via EI and all the complexities and red tape that go with all of that can be, can, that can be very challenging. And so for me, you know, we were lucky enough to work with Bay Advisory on this particular funding round. I'd love to have met that team sooner and maybe my recommendation to any you know younger companies in the audience would be to bring in financial advisory as early as you can if you don't have a CFO. Okay, Irina? Yeah, I, to, to, to add to your point, I think it just takes longer than you think. I think we were very lucky with Provere and we, um, you know, very similar to what Connor O'Sullivan from um, Atlanta Bridge was saying earlier on, we, as founders, myself and Connor, who co-founded Provere and with me, we took on expertise in the sense of a, a, a CEO who had done the pathway before um, and that was uh, I think a, a great um, move in order to be able to navigate the pathway and 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 move forward through the, the, the financing and the fundraising that we needed to do um, so we got good advice from um, our early investors in order to kind of move that forward and that was what we were very fortunate with but it still took so much longer even with that advice on board um, and, and with those people uh, the, the key kind of stakeholders that would know what, what was ahead of us um, so it's just to be prepared for that journey there was a definitely a, a naivety when we first kind of came across Proverum and, and started it that we'd be you know out, out in five years but you know here we are seven or eight years on so um, it, it's still it, it takes a lot longer than you think. And what about you know all of you have a technical knowledge technological USP what if someone just plagiarizes your idea what legal protections do you have that someone won't produce a similar implant or, or process or robot 
or whatever. Yeah, well, we have a strong IP portfolio that's been, um, you know, something that we started from day one. So that was always going to be a key, a key point. And just to keep abreast of that, to keep um, growing it, to watch out at other competitors and to ensure we have that kind of freedom to operate, um, you know, that we need to, to, to grow. Um, so it's just... Um, so who, who do you get your legal services from? Like, do you just go to a local solicitor? I mean, can you afford one of the big four? How does all that work? In our case, to answer the, you know, the, legal the legal question is that you know, sometimes uh, legal firms will work with startups on the understanding that they'll give you know, generous uh, rates they initially. They won't front load their fees. Exa right? Exactly. So like, we've been able to do, um, you know, whether it's, it's kind of organizing funding rounds or filing patents, those kind of things. In the early stages, but again, once you get funded, then you're, you're kind of, you know, you but owe them a, more. If there was a SWOT analysis of your business, <laughs> do you all have a downside risk that someone could take your technology or not? I don't believe it's just about the technology. You know, people buy from people. They buy from the vision of the company. They buy from, you know, how easy is this platform to use? And if someone went to come along tomorrow to try to build what we've built, firstly, technologically, it would take them a couple of years. But secondly, what, you know, regulatory perspectives do they meet? You know, they have to go through ICE 27001, DCB 0129, GDP or, you know, those things don't happen quickly. So for someone to try to catch up, not only would they have to build the technology, they'd probably need to build their own voice and vision and brand, you know, a unique interface and meet all those regulatory compliance pieces. So, you know, it's a competitive market that we work in, but we're still managing to compete. And I think it'll take some time for others to catch up. Okay. Best bit of a business advice I ever got was, Ivan, don't fall in love with your business. Flip it at the top of the market. What is your plan in this regard? Rina. Yeah, we, we, the VC people are looking at the exit door, and they want to hear yeah, this piece. We, we, we hope to exit. We hope to to, to get um, you know Provium acquired by a large um, multinational medical device company that can commercialise it across across the globe. So that 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 is our plan. Right. Yeah, I mean, health tech is a highly acquisitive space. Obviously, you know, on our roadmap at some point is either, you know, to IPO or potentially for an electronic healthcare record partner. We have many to potentially uh, to partner with us and, and potentially M&A there. Dollar signs? <laughs> um, so being maybe a little bit earlier stage than some of the other companies here, our, our kind of goal is not to die. Um, so for, for That's a, an essential prerequisite <laughs> to sell. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but like you're projecting for, so again, we don't have our, like, you know, we're, we're, we're not at near the top of the mountain yet. So we're kind of reluctant to commit exactly where we want to be in 10 or well, 15 I years. I suppose the question, I can feel in all of you that this is a huge part of your personal life journey. You, this is not just another investment as it might be to a VC, are you prepared to detach yourself from it? Of course. I, I, we have a strong social mission at the car, and I think that what we'd like to do is, at, at some point in time, like we won't be the best people to run the business anymore, and we'd hope that either if we're acquired um, or IPO'd, you know, either way, we're not going to be the people in charge anymore. I'm, I'm hopeful that you know, it'll be the right deal, not only financially, but also it'll allow the company to take the next step to be able to deliver the impact globally at scale that, you know, where all the founders and early, early hires we've made, like that's, the, that's the future we're investing in. John, you're a Kerry man, so cute, you don't need to be told. <laughs> we've got it all figured out. Yeah. Uh, just to the IP point, just for very briefly, I suppose, it, it, uh, I think one of the commentators there, one of the speakers mentioned about, you know, the, the business relationships you have, the vision you have, I think that's really important. And even if somebody is to come along and replicate your product identically, you have that feedback loop already happening with your customers and your stakeholders. You're treating every day as day one, you know, to quote Jeff, Jeff Bezos, and you're, you're focused on developing the product. So that's really hard to catch up to, no matter who you are. It doesn't matter if you're Google or Facebook or whatever. Uh, to, to the exit and, you know, what the plans are there, I truly have a strong belief that this business can be a global business and that we can really scale it across the UK. Obviously, what we're doing right now, North America and beyond. So that's exclusively what I'm focused on. And if the opportunities come later to exit or IPO, then we'll see that at the time. But uh, right now, it's pure focus on growth. Time. All right. Uh, we're, we're out of time. Um, can I say personally, and I'm sure on behalf of everyone, you are actually very inspirational. Uh, it is fantastic to see such a success stories and such entrepreneurship. We wish you every uh, continued success in your journey ahead. We hope it goes exactly as you plan it, uh, although it won't. And uh, 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 we wish you well. Ladies and gentlemen, please thank our founders panel. Okay, let's go.